Many of the world's important cities and towns are built close to water so that ships can be used to bring people the goods they need and take away the things they have to sell. A train more than three miles long would be needed to fill up just one big laker like this with iron ore. Heavy, bulky goods can be carried to distant factories at very low cost by ship. In the center of North America are the Great Lakes. They form the world's largest and busiest inland waterway system. Many places around the lakes have grown into important industrial centers because of the advantages of water transportation. For example, the Detroit-Windsor area has become heavily industrialized. It can get iron ore from the north and coal from the south. These are needed to make steel for cars and machinery some of which are also shipped to market by water. The United States and Canada share these great inland seas. From west to east, the five big lakes are Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. The St. Lawrence River connects them with the Atlantic Ocean. Of the five lakes, Superior is not only the largest, its surface is also highest above sea level. Water from the lake flows down through the St. Mary's River into Lakes Michigan and Huron, and on into Lake Erie. Then the water drops over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, more than 300 feet below. It drops another 250 feet in the St. Lawrence River on its way to the sea. In the early days, when people wanted to get past these steep and rocky places called rapids, they carried their light birch bark canoes over land. But then settlers came in bigger boats, which were far too heavy to carry. To let these boats get past the rapids, canals with locks were built. A lock is a kind of elevator for ships. canals were built for very small boats. When bigger ships appeared on the lakes, they couldn't get through, and the canals had to be enlarged. Building canals was difficult and expensive. At Niagara, a whole series of costly locks was needed to form a water staircase. But finally, there were canals around all the rapids and falls in the Great Lakes. At the mouth of Lake Superior, rapids in the St. Mary's River are bypassed by several large locks built side by side. More cargo is shipped through these locks than through any other canal in the world. Many of the Lakers carry prairie wheat bound for overseas. Others take iron ore to the steel towns farther down the lakes. Between Lakes Erie and Ontario are the Niagara Falls and the Welland Canal which bypasses them. Although ships cannot pass here, the rushing water is harnessed to make large amounts of electric power and a few miles away is the Welland Canal, where a ship can be raised or lowered step by step, more than 300 feet to get past the falls. But all the canals had not been built at the same time. Along the St. Lawrence, there were many dangerous rapids, and the canals were outmoded. These 
canals had been built many years ago. And ever since, boats have had to be kept small so they could squeeze their way through shallow, narrow locks. Late each fall, just before the waterways began to freeze over, there would be a long lineup of these small boats waiting to go through to their winter berths at Montreal. The old canals were a bottleneck. Big lake boats couldn't get through the canals to Montreal, and large ocean-going ships couldn't reach the lakes. Only very small boats were able to use these old canals. A large modern waterway was needed. That is why Canada and the United States agreed, after many discussions, to create a new canal system to benefit both nations, the St. Lawrence Seaway. To build it, old canals and land would have to be flooded by a new man-made lake, Lake St. Lawrence, and a series of large new locks would have to be built, two in the United States, the rest in Canada. The power of the river would also be harnessed at two large electric generating stations, one in Canada, the other shared by both countries. Work began in the summer of 1954, when Canada's Prime Minister turned the first sod. Whole towns had to be destroyed or moved, for soon they might be hazards to the great ships that would sail overhead in the new lake. Copper dams were built in sections of the St. Lawrence to hold back the water so that work could start in the riverbed itself. As the river was made to flow around the construction site, the dried up section of the riverbed was dug away. The river would have to be dredged, whole islands moved out of the way, and broad new channels would have to be dug. Enough rock and earth had been removed, millions of tons of concrete were poured into the excavations. As this one giant lock took shape, six others like it, and many miles of canals were also being built along the river. Finally, the locks were ready, each broader than a superhighway, longer than a city block. The distant coffer dam that had been built to hold back the water during construction was no longer needed. and the farms alongside, the abandoned town sites and old churchyards would soon be under many feet of water. Queen Elizabeth of Canada and President Eisenhower of the United States opened the St. Lawrence Seaway. Men have dreamed and worked for two and a half centuries to make this river navigable. 
And now, at last... The St. Lawrence Seaway presents to the world a 2,300-mile waterway of locks, lakes, and man-made channels. Lakers carry iron ore from west or east to the steel mills of the Great Lakes. And from Lake Superior, wheat goes right through to ports like Montreal. Now, deep sea ships can sail directly across the oceans of the world to lake ports where they have never been before to bring people the goods they need and take away what they have made or grown. Even people far from these busy ports and waterways will benefit from this great seaway for ocean ships and giant lakers. The Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence have long been important waterways. But now they have been linked into one great water highway reaching from the Atlantic Ocean 2,300 miles into the heart of the North American continent. Mm -hmm. 